this film speaks very loudly with the story of Jo Jaina. She's a light burning at the center of the film. I think she was someone of great vivacity and openness. It's her journey of coming into herself and being broken, but also wiser. What's rather wonderful about the story is that she finds a way to triumph over things and to regain some kind of power in a time where really women had very little. I would like to propose a toast to our host and benefactor, His Grace the Duke, and his beautiful new duchess. Please be upstanding. The Duke and Duchess. The Duke and Duchess. The Duchess of Devonshire was famous in her period as a political hostess. In the 18th century, a number of aristocratic women um, had a responsibility for the political life of the nation. They influenced politicians, they held dinner parties and evening events, and the Whig Party members would come and be entertained by them. And that's where politics really happened. It was outside Westminster, in the private houses of the aristocracy. I have many faults, as you well know. Not least among them is my ability to draw attention. Perhaps we could use that to our advantage. It was the first time that, that celebrity, if you like, was used um, for political gain. She was hugely influential in their politics, in their campaigning. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the man who will inform us of the work we must do and of the party we so believe in. The Duchess of Devonshire is unusual because she does become such a famous figure within the press as well, and so many images of her survive from caricaturists as well as portrait painters. So she has a notoriety that's perhaps unusual. In this one, it seems you've hit a winning streak for once. Mm, very good. <laughs> and in this one, you see... Is that dress really an appropriate way to attract voters? Ah, <laughs> uh, politicians know absolutely nothing about fashion. She'd turn up to rallies and, and there'd be people with fans with her face painted on it and there'd be, you know, this constant presence of, of journalists and there'd be gossip columns about her and it was all about the sort of the fashion. So you can draw huge links to the kind of today's celebrity culture, which I thought was quite fascinating because I think we often think that it's a, a modern phenomenon and actually the fact that it was going on in sort of the 1770s, 1780s is, is very interesting. Somebody did indeed ask me what kind of feather it is that I'm wearing. Well, there are only two specimens of this rare bird known to man. One of them has clearly ended up on top of my head. <laughs> and the other, rumour has it, is running for office in the Tory party. <laughs> the fame had this extraordinary effect on her. It, it made her um, both desperate to please, terrified of doing anything wrong, and shocked at her own celebrity and unable to figure out in her own mind why she was quite so famous. And you see the crippling effect it has on her sense of self. She starts to gamble uncontrollably, which is a way of you know, playing with chance, it's playing with danger, it's you know, seeing how, how far down the road you can get before anybody stops you. And no one ever stopped her. The race wins again. <laughs> she had been so terrified of disclosing the amount of, of money that she was in debt. That, uh, and to, to her husband, because she was convinced that he was going to divorce her or, you know, send her away. And actually, when she died, he found out how much she was in debt and said, God, is that all? It's really sad, this woman who was so consumed by something, and, and he, he thought it was going to be worse, and he wasn't that bothered. She became bulimic, which is a classic woman's way of reacting to pressure. She also took too many drugs. And again, that's another classic way of expressing emotional distress and protesting against authority. So she has these very modern problems, very modern addictions. Welcome back. Welcome back, Jean. Your presence has been sorely missed. I think she was very much a woman who loved being the center of attention, who loved the fact at some point that, that her picture was in the paper, that the, the clothes were always talked of, that, that you know, I mean, her ver every move was, was commented on. She did very much get caught up in, I think, what you'd call modern-day tabloids, but the 18th century version. The Duchess of Devonshire was famous for having characteristics which inspired and intrigued her contemporaries. She was supposed to have cast off 
the very formal manners of the time. She was supposed to be more warm and more energetic. And a number of letter writers talk about that in detail, and they find that surprising, but also very pleasing. So that suggests a turning point in the way that some of these women were expected to behave. However, the fact that the Duchess of Devonshire was criticised so extensively in the press and became so notorious for her behaviour suggests that there was something also very uncomfortable about it and she wasn't behaving quite in accordance um, with the way in which other 18th century women were expected to behave. What kind of man are you? She is my sole comfort in our marriage. You have robbed me of my only friend. What is wrong with me? There's something incredibly sad about her. I think she's a victim of, I think she's a victim of herself. I think she's a, she's a victim of her own innocence. Um, I, I think she's a victim of, of people using her for their own gain. Even though she seemed to have everything, you realize that it was not that simple. And with all of her privilege came a lot of burden and things are never what they really appear to be. I think we made a decision early on that we had to use real locations, not you know, create sets. And the real locations had to be doing a lot of the work for us. So we spent a lot of time choosing the right places. An old dangling bachelor who was single at 50. I think to shoot in real locations where the real, the real fabric of the time is around you is, is fantastic. Action. It's very different to playing something in a studio. You know, you, you really get a sense of, of where these people were, of, of the, the scale that they lived in, the reality of that. There's obviously the room you're shooting in, but just around corridors, corners, bookshelves, paintings, gardens, vistas, ceilings, all those little things just does, does something to you imaginatively. The wonderful thing about this film featuring scenes filmed here at Chatsworth is that this building was Georgina's home. It belonged to her husband, the fifth Duke. And although a lot of their social life was spent in their house in London, they spent many, many parts of each year here at Chatsworth. Some of the family apartments were redecorated for her by the most fashionable French designers of that time, and some of that work still survives. The house always had a dual function. It was here as a family's home, and it was also here as a symbol of their wealth, their power, their authority in Derbyshire, their closeness to the king. Chatsworth is one of the busiest sort of visitor, attra visitor attractions in England and, uh, and also had been stamped on pretty hard by Pride and Prejudice. So while it's very important that we went there, there's only certain parts of it that are feasible to use with the tens of thousands of visitors that go there every day. Visitors don't actually see the rooms that she lived in because they're still the family rooms. But nonetheless, they come across portraits of her. She's an important part of the story. So there's a real sense of her being not that far back in the past. London streets actually are a difficult thing to find and Greenwich really is one of the only places that you really can manage to make it work. And I think what was great is that Michael did make it look you know, like we haven't seen it before because it has been used a lot. We've all been there before so uh, we had to try and do something a bit different. It's uh, well one of two big exteriors in the film and we really wanted to do that third world thing where you know the, the world that, that she lives in is, is not the world of everybody which is often the danger of a period film that uh, we just we just it's a film about the upper classes and we never really see the rest of what's going on so we wanted to have the whole range of society in this big busy street that was always a big thing for us and, and, and a real challenge for the for the um, design department Julia and I wanted to be able to look as kind of 360 as possible you know, to look up 
that way down the street and we'll turn the camera and look back that way.